Hello everyone, my name is Logan and welcome back to the lecture hall. Um, today we have a new video series. It's called What the Function? Because we can't say fuck on YouTube. Uh, and in this series we go into a deep dive on some sort of mathematical concept, maybe obscure or well-known. And this first video is going to be on the Rado graph. For my Math 195W final project, we had to write a 5 to 10 page research paper. And then we had to make a 5 to 10 minute video presentation. Mine was on the Rado graph and I figured, hey, this would be kind of a cool video idea for YouTube. So if you like, you know, graph theory or, you know, maybe random mathematical stuff, this is the series for you. Um, please enjoy and have a great day. Hello, everyone. My name is Logan and welcome back to the lecture hall. Today I'm doing my final presentation for Math 195W. This is the Upper Div Math Writing course at UCI. So I would like to pose the question, what the function is the Rado graph? Well, before we can even get into that, we have to talk about what are graphs. A graph denoted G is equal to VE is a set of edges and vertices. The vertices are just dots and our edges are lines that connect uh, two vertices. So now what is a random graph? It is a graph G and P where N is the number of vertices and P is the probability that one vertex is connected to another by an edge. And now we have this lovely little picture to show and we see, okay, well, there's clearly an edge between V2 and V1, but there's not an edge between V3 and V6. And all of these edges were randomly chosen. So this is an, a random graph. Now onto the Rado graph the meat and potatoes, one might say, of this presentation. It is an infinite random graph that has probability of one half that one vertex is connected to another by an edge. In random graph notation, it could be denoted G uh, infinity comma one half. And we denote the Rado graph as R. It was originally found in 1937 by Wilhelm Ackerman as a directed graph, but later it was rediscovered by Richard Rado in 1964 as a universal graph. It has some really cool properties that always hold, and that's important, they always hold um, for the Rado graph. First, the extension property. For every, for every two finite disjoint sets, U and V, there exists a vertex P outside of both sets that is connected to every element in U by an edge and is not connected to any vertices in the set V. So we can see this by our picture. P is clearly connected to every element in U, but it's not part of the set U, and it's clearly not connected to anything in V. How would we go about proving this? And I won't delve into the proof for time's sake, but we need to show the first that the probability the extension probability fails for the Rado graph is zero. And then we also have to show that any two countable graphs with the extension property are isomorphic to one another. Now onto our next property, the induced subgraph property. Every finite or countably infinite graph is an induced subgraph of the Rado graph. What's that saying? Well, that means every finite and uh, countably infinite graph can be found inside of the Rado graph. And that's really cool. But this, this is interesting, but we need a better definition of what an induced subgraph is. If we let G equal to VE, as you know, seen above, and we let G prime equal V prime E prime, it is an induced subgraph of G if the vertices V prime are a subset of the vertices in V, and if every edge in G connected by vertices V prime is an E prime. So say we have the graph G and we took a subset of the vertices V1, V3, V4, and V6. Our induced subgraph would be all of the red edges and red vertices in the figure on the right, right here. So this is our induced subgraph of our graph. Now onto the uniqueness property. The Rado graph is the only countably infinite graph up to isomorphism with the extension property. And we kind of get that, right, from lemma two that I showed above in the extension property. You know, any two graphs that are isomorphic, well, or that have the extension property are isomorphic to one another. So that means that all graphs are all infinite graphs that, are, that, are, that have the extension property are isomorphic to R. Now onto symmetry. The Rado graph R is a symmetric graph, which means it is both edge transitive and vertex transitive. The graph is vertex transitive if any two vertices, VI and VJ, there exists an isomorphism such that phi of VI is equal to VJ. And then same for edge transitive, if two edges EI 
and ej, there exists an isomorphism psi such that psi of ei is equal to ej. Now onto robustness of the radio graph, and I think this is really cool. If you delete a finite number of vertices or edges from the graph, it does not change the extension property. What that means is it is still isomorphic to R, right? Because it still has the uh, extension property. So if with our example, we take R and then we get rid of the first 87th and 4,000th vertices, and then the 69th and the 9,000th 9, edge. Why did I choose those numbers? I don't know. This is just an example. Well, there will still be an isomorphic map back to R, even if we remove all of these from R. And this is where we get into like the bigger robustness pro property, the partition property. And it states for any partition of the radio graph, at least one of these subgraphs is isomorphic to the whole radio graph. And it needs to be said that it is a finite uh, number of partitions. But well, we can see from our picture, let's just say we partitioned R into five sets or five dis disjoint sets. Well, this RP, will still be isomorphic to R, which means it'll still have the extension property. And I think that is really cool. So here is where the presentation kind of takes a turn. And we're going to dive into how we can express these properties in terms of logical statements. And for that, we need uh, Fagan's result. This was found by Ronald Fagan in 1976 and another group of Russian mathematicians in I forget what year. They were found independently. Um, so it states, let Q be any first order property of a graph, then the probability of Q happening is equal to zero or one. Now, well, we need a first order property, that's a statement, we need a definition for this. And it is a st statement that is either true or false, typically expressed in words or logical notation. And an example of this is it's raining outside right now. Well, that's false. It's actually a very nice night. Or I have fuzzy socks on right now. That's true, I do. And so the interesting part of this is that all first order statements can be written in terms of first order logic. And that's cool because we know that, as I said before, these properties of the radio graphs always happen. And so since they always happen, it means it's a first order property, which means we can show it in terms of logic. Okay, cool. But now we need to get into some symbols for logic just so we know what we're looking at. So what symbols do we need to express graph properties in terms of logic? Well, variables that I will use, the lowercase uh, letters I will use to symbolize vertices, and the uppercase letters I will use to represent sets of vertices. We have our for all symbol, which is the upside down A. We have our there exists symbol, which is the backwards E. And then we have oper uh, operators like the wedge, which is and. We have our V, which is the or. We have our negation, which is, I guess, I don't know how to describe it. And then we have our implies, which is our one way arrow. And then we have such that, which is a colon. And then there are two relations that we will be using. We will be using equality and the little uh, equivalent symbol, which will represent an edge. And these can only compare two variables. So we cannot say X and Y are related to Z. We have to say X is related to Z and Y is related to Z. So an example, what if we wanted to say our graph has no isolated vertices? We would say for all X, there exists a V such that X has an edge with V. And that, what it does is that says our graph has no isolated vertices. So now we can go on to one of our properties, our favorite property, the extension property, the one that always comes up. For every two finite disjoint sets U and V, there exists a vertex P outside of both sets that is connected to every element in U by an edge and is not connected to a vertex in the set V, right? A little refresher. We can now transform this into logical operators and it would seem it would be this easy for all u and u and for all v and v such that u does not equal v this implies there exists a p such that u does not equal p and there a v does not equal p and u is related to p and u is not or v is not related to p well that's what it seems like but we actually can't do that the problem with that is it only accounts for two possible disjoint sets we need to, for it to account for all possible disjoint sets. So the proper way to express this would be with a multiple first order statement. We have to state for all U and R, 
and for all v and r such that u does not equal to v, right? So this is that. And then we have what we had before, such that for all u and u and for all v and v, uh, such that u does not equal v, this implies there exists a p such that u does not equal p and v does not equal p and u is related to p and v is not related to p. When we say related, I mean has an edge between them. And this is only slightly different from the previous statement, but now it accounts for all disjoint subsets of U and V in R. And so for time's sake, we, I'm only going to show this one property in terms of logic, but it is cool to see that we are able to take Rado, the Rado graph properties and do them in terms of first order logic. So brief overview. The Rado graph is a random graph denoted R is equal to G infinity one half. Cool. It is unique in the fact that it is the only countable infinite, countably infinite graph up to isomorphism with the extension property. It is a symmetric graph that contains every other finite graph inside it as an induced subgraph. And taking a finite amount of vertices or edges away from R or partitioning it does not take away the extension property, which then also means that the partitions and the changes to it means it's still isomorphic to R. And finally, all of these properties can be expressed in terms of first order logic. So that is the end of my presentation. I know I spoke fast. I had a lot to get through and there's a 10 minute time limit. Hopefully I made it. Um, as always, my name is Logan. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.